Hello, and welcome to the Real Construction Owners Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Ledford, and today we are honored to have Tony Johnson with us. He's the brains behind a booming construction company that has raked in an impressive $160 million in revenue. For our listeners and their information, we proudly fund this show through contributions from our dedicated members at federalconstructionuniversity.com. This is an exclusive platform designed to guide contractors, you, in unlocking the secrets to amassing wealth by grabbing a hold of federal construction projects across the United States. If you're a contractor aiming to diversify and grow your clientele, this knowledge is indispensable. The membership will provide you with regular accountability calls, access to invaluable recorded content, and a promise that you will make a minimum of $30,000 in profit within your initial 90 days of joining us. And if you don't, you don't pay a dime. If you're intrigued, discover more by arranging a chat with me and my team by going to milliondollarfederalcontractor.com. You'll see that link down below. Now, without further delay, let's dive into our conversation with Tony. Welcome to the Real Construction Owners Podcast, where we interview real construction owners doing big things to help you go from being a stressed out operator to a thriving business owner. Today, we have a great guest. His name is Tony Johnson. He's the owner of Timeless Properties Construction Group. And man, do we have a story for you. This gentleman, he's done over $160 million in construction projects. He's been through the crash and how he pivoted his business to continuously generate business. He's doing national franchises now and commercial development. So listen, if you're a contractor that wants to learn how to grow your business, get more revenue, and just become a thriving owner, then you're going to want to pay close attention. Here we go. Tony, how you doing, my man? Thanks, sir. How about yourself? Man, I'm truly blessed and highly favored, as I always say. Thanks for asking. Yes, sir. I, I see you're in your office. It looks like you have a massive printer first for some specs and plans. It, are you the man who who looks over all the de- details, or or what are you doing in this, this office right here? Oh, I do have the plotter in my office, though. That's It's the whole office plotter, so it just sits in my office. I do print out plans still. Actually, right now, we're transitioning with our new project management software to doing digital takeoffs. But we have, uh, for the past, you know, 16 years, done everything still by hand, printed out 24 by 36s and runs hand scales and do takeoffs. Um, but we have been pivoting away from that as we've expanded and scaled and tried to develop further processes. And that's one of them we're transitioning out of right now. Tony, I'm curious, before we get started into the meat and potatoes and we we give back to the, the construction uh, group, I'm curious about your, your story. I'm curious about your background, how it all got started. And in that story, people are listening and they're wondering, why should I listen to this guy? So if you could... Tell us your history and your story. Sure. So to back up a little before I was a contractor, right when I graduated college, which I barely made it through, um, I was a bartender through college and decided to open a bar with some of the guys I was working at the bars with. So four of us got together, opened a bar. And so my first dive into business was a bar and as you would probably guess, the bar, everyone's drinking and getting drunk every all the time. So I dealt with the challenge of trying to operate a business uh, in a very tumultuous environment where the partners weren't really interested in doing business. They were interested in partying and having a great time. So it was fun, but it was a great learning experience. So uh, we did that for about six years before I was able to exit. When I exited at that point, uh, I promised myself I would never, you know, do a partnership again. I would just go on my own. Um, in the interim, I got a job selling building materials in that job. It was for 84 Lumber Company, a great company for anybody that's interested in understanding construction. If you hadn't been in the industry, they have a, um, 
management program that they put you through and really trained you on every aspect of building through that management process. Through that, I went and got into construction sales, outside sales, and started dealing with a lot of contractors, um, understanding the needs that they had on homes and doing takeoffs of plans they would give me and started developing an understanding of how to job cost a home for people. And in that process, I'd have builders you know, they might be new to building and not even know how to do a takeoff or how to get an estimate out to clients. So they would call us and have us do all the takeoffs, provide that to them. A lot of things we would offer them turnkey, but we really sold the full gamut. So you could almost buy the entire house from us. We actually sold full home packages where we would turnkey the home um, for people. So in that process, I learned a lot about construction. Um, and so watching all of those contractors come in and during the boom was when I was doing that. And so, you know, it was 06 and 07 and these people had no idea what they were doing. They were making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I was like, these guys can do it. Why not me? So by the time I got through, got my contractor's license, had saved up some money, the market crashed. So I got my license and I can remember uh, to try and get jobs initially is very difficult. So I. I what I did was research the public opportunities. So there are public bids that you can get through your county, through your city, through you know local school systems. There's a ton of different facets where they do a public bid offering. And some of the really small ones, they even had HUD housing, which we did initially, right in the very beginning, they had really small ones. I was able to get a $600 contract at one of the universities for just cleaning out a building that was about to be demolished. So I thought it was the biggest thing ever. You get six hundred dollar job. We went and swept out this building right before it was going to get, uh, you know, pulled out a bunch of junk. You know, it probably took us three days for this worth of junk, and we, we we got a couple things that we kept. And I was like, man, this is the best thing ever. And then they <laughs> gave me, uh, they, they said, you did such a great job. We'll give you this other one. Nobody seems to want to do. It's a twenty two hundred dollar job cutting this block wall out. So and it's in the middle of the night. You got to do it in the middle of the night, off school hours. I was like, oh, that's okay. That's okay. You're like, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm ready to go. So anyway, so we went through that. And you know, the project manager that worked for the university sat there with me and helped me because he had to monitor it. And so, you know, through that I started to build a relationship with them and and built up a track record with them of, you know, doing things on budget, on time. And started to grow that relationship and did the same thing uh, with a gentleman at the city and did another thing with a different school system, some public school system individuals and started to kind of grow. And the thing that was nice about those is they had a project manager and it was, uh, you know, repetitious business. So they would keep coming back with new projects. Maybe they had a budget they needed to do. So the repetition kept me going in the beginning with those people. So that was my first thought process then was I need to find people that I can do replicatable business with. And so looking at homes and remodels doesn't have that. So that's what drew me to commercial because if you can get into commercial, you know, you get into a franchise or a business and they're replicating that model. So once you build it once, you're going to build it again. And then you understand that once you can build that, you're one of the people that can build that. And so then it repeats itself over and over. So you get further opportunities. So we looked at trying to get into doing franchise upfits. And so when you look at that, you get a franchise opportunity with someone, a franchisee, you do a great job, then that franchise has your information. They might recommend you to another franchisee in the area. So that was my thought process on how to get going from the very beginning. I didn't have a lot of processes at that time, but that was the critical way to get started. And there's so many nuggets of wisdom that you just dropped right there, Tony. And, you know, relationships are so important. That's why I love government construction, because these contracting officers, they literally have 11 opportunities on their desk every day. And when they those get done, 11 more get on their desk. And when those get done, 11 more get on their desk. And the government has to spend a billion dollars every single day. That's that's their budget. And if you do a good job once and they know you, they like you, they trust you, they will literally give you opportunities left and right. And it sounds like you took that relationship approach where it's not just a one-time transaction and saw the power of those relationships to, to keep feeding your pipeline. Now, I'm curious, with this commercial development as well as these uh, franchises, how does one find a franchise upfit opportunity? Where does one go for that? 
That's a great question, Justin. So it, it was a challenge and it took me a few years to really get a grasp on it. Not, you know, I've still constantly I'm furthering my grasp and there's more than one way to do it. But initially what I started doing was going around to the shopping centers and the shopping centers have leasing agents. So if you go to a shopping center and find a leasing agent, they're typically leasing to the tenant. So when they're leasing to the tenant, they have the person that's going to be going into a space. And so if you can get in touch with them and sell yourself to them, you can get an opportunity maybe to speak to a tenant. So if they, you know, can I give you my card? Can, if a tenant comes by, can you maybe use me as a referral? Something else that comes out of that, that you would be able to do that I do a lot of is you actually offer services to them. So a lot of times you'll have in a retail space, let's say a tenant goes out of business, leaves everything in the space and junks it up hard for them to lease it up again at that point. So they need to sometimes clear it out and put it back to a vanilla box. So if you've come by and you're, yeah, I can help you out with that. I'll give you a good deal on vanilla box and that start building a relationship at that point by just clearing it out and doing just the minimal work. Or maybe they have a little bit more than typical maintenance work that their maintenance guy can't handle, but it's not a big job and they can't seem to find anybody to do it. You offer to do that, get a foot in the door at a very minimal rate, and then you get on their list. Once you're on their list as an approved vendor and they've got you on a payroll, so once they take your W-9 to get all your insurance, you're set up. So you're going to be one of the people that they then call for future problems that they have to solve. Right. And so that's how you start a relationship. You do whatever to get in the door. So my motto always was in the beginning, go in. I don't care if I make money, lose money, what I'm doing. I just want to open that door for business. Once that door is open for business, I will work to make money in the future. So it's all about exactly what you stated in the beginning. Build that initial relationship, then build upon the relationship. Wow. Very high level insights right there. Curious about uh, the also commercial opportunities. I, as, as people who've been listening to me know, there's different websites for the government where people can go and find all the deals. And for my members and my coaching platform, I have something called the bidding opportunities list where I had a coder put it all in an Excel spreadsheet so they don't have to go to the different websites. They can type in control F and then, you know, 95 roofs are control F roof. And then 95 roofs are available today to bid control F general contracting, you know, 200 general contracting opportunities available to bid right this second. But what I'm saying with you is where do you go to find those public commercial opportunities? What back when you were doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I still do those today. And so those will be you, you they are so any, depending on the price point. So if it's a very small one, they don't publicly list it because it's not required to be publicly listed. So when it hits a certain dollar amount and those dollar amounts are different for the whatever the you know, if it's a college or if it's a county, those dollar levels are different. Some lower levels, they can just contract it out. But once you get to a, a minimum criteria, then they publicly list the bid. So it does go on the web. So you can just search your county bid list. So what you can just do is look up blank, blank county, current bids, blank, blank county, uh, current bids, or blank school system, current bids. And then you'll get uh, normally to a website, their website, where they have current bid opportunities. Then they'll have a pre-bid date where you need to go. Typically, they're mandatory to attend. You go, you get all of the information, you either buy or have the architect email you the drawings and you have the drawings, then you'll have a specified bid date and a spec sheet. Now, you will have to have some experience, you know, uh, and you want to get at, you want to start at the lower level as you're getting up. So you don't want to go and bid on a $2 million job if you've only done $200,000 jobs, because they're going to want to see some experience at the level that you're bidding. Recent irrelevant <laughs> references. That's right. The other thing that you want to bear in mind is they will require a bid bond once you get to a certain level. Sometimes that's 300,000, sometimes it's 500,000. It depends on, again, where you're going for the bid, but that's something to pay attention to. If it requires a bid bond, you're going to need to have pretty good relevant experience. Maybe And strong, finan and strong financials and, if you're, you're going to do bid bonding. Yep. 
Yeah. And so those are some of the other things that make it a little challenging, but that's why I say you can go in. Once you create a contact with someone, you just go into these different departments, call, find out who the contact is, and then see if you can do anything or anything to get a door open for yourself. And that's how you typically would start with any of those. I like that. I'm curious with, um, with this city and commercial sector, in the government realm, they have got, uh, what is known as eminent domain. So I personally like because I'm I'm just I'm a roofing contractor in Texas where there's no license for for being a roofer. But when you're when I'm doing HVAC deals, you know you have to have an HVAC license or plumbing, etc. But in the government realm, you don't because you can just find the best guy in that town who has that license and subcontract it to him, and you be the middleman without the license and just do the paperwork and have them do the work. With what you're doing, does it require licensing? Yes. So if I'm the general contractor, it does require licenses. Now, they will do that, but typically in my market, in North Carolina and in South Carolina, you have to be the license holder, and then there would be no reason to pull somebody else in unless it had, unless it was a multifaceted job. And again, then it would require a contractor if it's over $30,000. Now, I'm um, curious, what's this is going to sound redundant, but maybe for somebody who hasn't got it yet, but what's the process that you have in place right now in your business that enables you to win large contracts, an actual process? Well, a pro my pro we have tons of processes that we've written up, and I think processes are very important. And anyone getting into construction, just to start briefly on that, I would definitely suggest a book called Traction. So traction Amen. has a process. Amen. Called, One of the best, best books ever. That's right. It's, you know, entrepreneurial operating system. So that will guide you to think through things that are beyond where you are in a business right now, more than likely, but it will help you to set up structures to allow you to grow and scale. And you really need to do that. Then the next thing that you need to do is start, you know, finding ways to, delegate to others so you don't overrun yourself and get burned out in your business. Um, amen. But amen. To, like with, to add to what you're saying, the EOS method, it, it teaches you how to run your Monday meetings. It teaches you how to establish rocks for, or, or task for each key employee on your team. So that way there's no overlap. It teaches you how to build a culture and how to have the culturally meetings and what exactly to do in those you know, four, four times a year. It's a phenomenal uh, process-based business that is deep and intense. And you can't, like, I listened to it in audiobook and I realized to myself, Tony, wow, I got to buy this book. And I actually have to, with a pen and a highlighter and a, a notepad, like study this book. It's not something you can just casually listen to if you're a business owner. Absolutely not. Yeah. And I did the same thing. Actually, I listened to the audio book. Then I went and bought the book. Then I went and bought the whole series of books. Then you go same and here, you can start here. breaking it down further. Oh, yeah. I see. The way, you know, you, they have an implementer they can offer you, which is highly expensive, or you can implement yourself. But they have free they have free products online and there's groups all over. Um, I did. That I implemented it helping. myself as well. It was like $60,000 for a person mm -hmm. that's once a week or once a month. I was like, man, I'm going to figure this stuff out myself. I'll, <laughs> right. So yeah, tell me, really. tell me um, your business org organization. You have visionary integrator, person in charge of service operations, person in charge of growth, recruiting. Walk us through that. So the person who's trying, the contractor who's trying to grow their business, they can kind of get an idea of what you've created and how you created that. Sure. Well, mine has obviously been a, a development and process and, and has slowly grown and developed in its own method, like a lot of people's will. But once you, the, the first thing that you'll start to do is once you get to a certain level of business, you have to let go of portions of the business. And the first thing to let go of are repeatable tasks. So simple, repeatable tasks, letting go of those. And so how I started is initially it was just me. And I had, uh, when I started initially, I still worked my day job of selling building materials. So I had initially hired a 1099 superintendent and had him help me. And I did everything else, administrative, all the bidding, all the everything. After the bidding and the administrative and all the billing and the payroll got to be quite a bit to manage and handle, 
I brought in an office manager and trained her and basically wrote down everything. So what I would do is I would take what I was doing that day, write it down. What am I doing this hour? Write it down. What am I doing this hour? Write it down. And then I went through those items that I wrote down and said, well, who can do this as easy as I'm doing it, right? And then you start to peel those off. And I got an office manager in and she was doing, you know, the invoicing and the payroll and, and this. And it was a slow process learning. And, you know, we put QuickBooks and, and ran it through that. But we didn't have any formal type of management, right? It was just a QuickBooks and me doing quotes through the QuickBooks and everything like that. So as we kept on getting a little bit bigger and adding more facets, it, it became a little more complex. So we added, you know, more uh, superintendents. Then I had to get people W-2. It couldn't be 1099 anymore because it was getting growing a little larger. Um, then we we felt, felt like we were all running around and there was really no organizational process before this EOS. So the first thing that we did was we grabbed a project management software. And there's a ton of them out there. They're all different price variations. Um, so we started with one called Builder Trend, which is an okay software. It's highly marketed. You know, I, I didn't think it was that fantastic. After maybe two years with that one, and we didn't really fully implement it, but it had a lot of things to help us first create and organize the company. We moved to a different, a newer one that was called a smaller one, and it's not highly advertised. It's called Contractor Foreman. Now, this Contractor Foreman project management software, you, it does, we did all our estimates, every single thing. So we did estimates, schedules. We created and started taking pictures of what we do daily and daily logs, and then you write what you're doing daily. And so everyone in the field started to get involved in the project management software. So we would do enter bills through there, pay bills through there, everything. So once everybody was on the same page with that one project management software, we started to get organized because we're all communicating with the same thing. And so that's where we started to create processes when we started using that. Now, with that being said, I think there's a couple more components of uh, your org chart that we should hit on, such as... Um, the revenue producing or the growth sector. So one thing, uh, twice a year, I have a, a nice home in Costa Rica, uh, right on a river, at, on a beach. It's phenomenal. And I have some cabins and I take owners out and we just mastermind and surf and fish and do fun things. And um, one of the things we teach is called the SOG method, service, operations, and growth. And within the service department, you have your own leader and under them, they have their people. And then operations, they have their own leader and then people under them. And then within the growth department, you have their own leader and then people under them. So let's talk about growth because that's an area I don't think you hit on in your org chart. What, uh, what, who's doing that? Estimators, salespeople, hit on that, please. Sure. So how we're structured right now is I am still the main growth oriented. So I am a visionary. I'm out networking. I'm out trying to gain opportunities. So that's my main role with the company right now. I have a senior project manager who heads up our service. Now he's a senior project manager of commercial. Then I have a project manager that heads up our multifamily when we're doing multifamily builds and residential homes for doing high-end homes. And then I have a paint and drywall division where we do paint and drywall for other builders. And so that division has a head of that division. He has an office manager for his division. Then he has crew leaders below him that run all the crews in the field. My senior project manager for commercial construction, I have the senior project manager. Then we have field superintendents. We have assistant superintendents. And then we have administrative assistant uh, for under him who works for him and for me. And it's the same uh, setup for my project manager on the residential side. That's how we're that's, structured. That's real good stuff. Um, buying back your time. You know, that's a great book by Dan Martell. I don't know if you can see it. It's, uh, it's so bright in here, but buy back your time by Dan Martell talks about how we as the hard charging visionaries, we can actually buy back our time and make a machine that produces a bigger machine and, and, and get us out of the seat doing the thing and find somebody else to do the thing. And highly recommend you check that book out and study it like you did the traction method. Curious KPIs for these sales for the person who's trying to bring in the new business. 
I know you said you do that, but you have other divisions. Do you have KPIs for those individuals who are trying to bring in the new business? Uh, well, we do. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, what everybody's got different. Basically, so we do for lead generation. It's not just me out networking. We do Google ads. I do mailers. I have contacts within the commercial realtor market. So we, I'm doing mass emails to the commercial real estate agents. I'm constantly, anything that pops up when a real estate agency pops their sign down, I'm contacting the agent, putting my name in the hat, saying I want to develop this site. I want to do this. I want to do that. Who's looking at this? You know, so I'm then taking that opportunity. So when I have new franchise opportunities, I'm pushing them back over to those agents to try and reciprocate and build that network further. Um, and my guys do the same thing. So when something comes in from a Google lead, it's distributed. My guys are the first contact. I normally don't uh, contact or meet people anymore. Um, so that's handled completely outside of my purview. I'm more just coming up with new methods. And we're constantly looking at hiring and bringing in great talent. That's a lot of what I focus on. Um, but, you know, on a high level, I do still network and build relationships and prior clients that dealt with me when I was more in into it, they'll want to deal with me still. So then I get involved and pulled back in. But I like to keep it out of my purview as much as possible to free up time for me to think and create and vision how I can get to my goals. I um, love that. There's a guy, uh, Jack Chan, who owns a big slate company, Durable Slate. And he's like you, he's very, very passionate and he's very good at what he does. And even though he has the resources, he still likes to, it, he has a passion for the work that he's doing. And I can tell that you have that passion for the work that you're doing. Now, switching topics, what's one of the last books that you read cover to cover and the lesson you learned from it? Well, I just finished, oh my gosh, what's the name of this book? I mean, I finished 2X to 10X. And then, I mean, I'm, that's all I do is listen to books and go from book to book to book. But the one I just finished today, I don't even know the name of it, but let me go back and find it. Never Split the Difference. Such a good book. I listen to that every year by Chris Voss, teach, <laughs> yeah, teaching Chris you Voss. how to be an expert negotiator and win <laughs> in hostage situations of negotiations. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, as I think we mentioned before we came on here, so I pride myself on being as honest and trustworthy, and I really hold my integrity at a high level because, you know, with any business, your reputation precedes you. So if you go out and you do the right thing and you are a quality person and you live what you breathe and what you say you do, you will build up that reputation and it gets around quicker than you know. And it gets around even faster when you don't do that. So my, you know, our core values, going back to EOS, we have strict core values that anybody I look at and anybody I want to bring on has to be honest, has to have a high level of integrity, has to have passion for what they're doing and in this industry, because we all do here, right? And so, you know, we always believe that that integrity and passion goes from start to finish on everything we do. And that's how I get every client. And I'd rather not get a job than um, present them an estimate that I know has a bunch of fluff built in the backside that I'm going to change order them on. So we go and give them everything up front. And a lot of times I'll have clients come and say, wow, you're way, you're way too high. You're out of the ballpark. Um, you know, uh, the two things I always tell them is, are they going to, what's their guarantee on the timeline? And do they have any guarantee? They're not going to give you change orders. Have they covered this, 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 that's not on the drawing. And believe it or not, a lot of times still we lose the business, but I, it's okay. And a lot of times after we lose that business and that person, as I told you, I do a lot of replicatable business people. Those people always come back to me for the second, the third, the fourth and on. So I might lose the first job, but I keep my integrity and they go through the ringer with the first contractor and get the double price change orders and everything else. And then I get a client for life. So there's something to be said for maybe not getting it, but keeping a relationship. So never be sour when you don't get a job. You always want to be as professional as possible and maintain that relationship. Man, dropping bombs. That's good information over here, Tony. Final question, best tip you could give an owner who is currently leading your team or wants, wants to lead a team who wants to leave a legacy and make a dent in the universe? 
something that we are just starting and, you know, I don't know. I, I've always tried to figure out what's the best way to give back and kind of give everyone a feel good moment. So what we are just implementing, we just put live on our site and what we're going to start doing on every job moving forward is, uh, which helps, I think, give back is we've picked five charities, you know, lo some local, some national and mix that. So every job that we get moving forward, the client picks which charity they want us to donate to a portion of our profits will go to that charity. Then if they, in addition, refer us to another client and that client gets a contract with us, we'll double whatever that investment was to the charity of their choice. So it, then it goes in their name, the donation. And, uh, you know, so we feel like that's a, a good thing, a good selling point and good selling feature and kind of gives back. And it helps us to get involved with places that we want to be involved with. So, you know, I have a, I'm a big, big advocate against child sex slavery and, you know, um, child trafficking. So there's a great movie that just came out recently about that. And, you know, it's, it's an important subject to me. So, you know, the aerial recovery is one of the ones on our list. And so they're a group that goes in and rescues children from that. Roy Johnson, do a timeless properties construction company. Man, you came here today, you delivered the goods. If you were to give one last parting piece of wisdom to a contractor who is maybe stuck under 5 million and trying to get to that next level, what would it be? Delegate and hire. Hire till you're scared to death. Just keep hiring people and keep networking around your community. Tony, thanks for being on the Real Construction Owners Podcast today, man. Thanks so much for having me, Justin. Thank you all for tuning in and giving me your time. I trust that you found our discussion enriching. If you did, please kindly hit that subscribe button and drop your thoughts in the comments section below. For those who are keen in propelling their construction venture to an eight-figure mark, visit milliondollarfederalcontractor.com where you can schedule a call with me and my team and you can find that link in the description down below. Furthermore, don't miss out on your chance of getting my book while it's at a steep discount, Federal Construction Contracts Simplified. This book is the key to navigating the labyrinth of government construction contracts with ease. We give you a blueprint and teach you how to win these government contracts simply. And if you just have something to follow, you can do it. But if you try to do this without a guide, it will literally take you years. Trust me, because I failed for years and then I figured it out and now I'm giving that away to you. Simply click on the URL below. Got it? I'll see you in the next episode.